It's Sunday, March 12, 2023. Welcome to The Weekend Show, where we take a deep dive into the news of the week. You can subscribe to my work and get exclusive access to bonus content, live Q&As and more at patreon.com slash 5-Minute News. Joining us today is the author of the book Melania and Me, The Rise and Fall of My Friendship with the First Lady, former friend and advisor to Melania Trump, Stephanie Winston Wolkoff. Welcome to The Weekend Show. Thank you for having me, Anthony. So uh, you're one of those people I like to say was in the room where it happens, uh, which has kind of been immortalized in a, in a song from Hamilton now. And uh, Hamilton's kind of perfect, really, when talking about the, the administration for so many, for so many reasons. Um, let's just go back a little bit. For the people that don't know you or maybe haven't read your book, let's just uh, explain when, what you were doing when you first came into contact with uh, Melania Trump. Uh, I think you were working for Vogue magazine. Is that right? Yes, I was. I was the uh, director of special events for Vogue magazine for over a decade, working with Anna Winter um, and Andre Leon Talley. And I happened to meet Melania when she came into the offices of Vogue um, as Donald's girlfriend, uh, preparing her for her coming out as soon to be Donald's fiance and then wife. Um, so I was there in the beginning before, you know, anyone knew who Melania Naus was. Um, and we just instantaneously became friends. And you stayed with Melania as friend and then advisor, and, and then you moved to the White House effectively as your place of work with her, and you were there for a, a couple of years, right? Yes. I mean, I had my own company, you know, for many years. And um, when Melania asked me to work on the inauguration and then to uh, help advise her um, for her role as leading lady, first lady of the United States, um, I closed down my company. Um, and uh, moved basically to back and forth. You know, I was living in D.C. for quite some time, but I was also back and forth weekly to New York City. And, and that inauguration drew the largest audience ever to witness inauguration period, both in person and around the globe. Absolutely, Anthony. Don't you Is know that, right? that by now? Don't you? Uh, yeah. I mean, have it. Hello. <laughs> no, hardly, hardly. Quote, quoting, quoting Sean Spicer there. Yes. But, um, so... The moment that happened, that Sean Spicer first press conference where he said those words, because, of course, we'd all seen the pictures of those. It was like a white tarp that they put on the ground, right, right which exposed the fact that there was like empty grassy areas. Um, and then, of course, there was that famous uh, comparison picture with yes. the Obama inauguration, which was full. And the moment for those of us who are journalists and were looking upon and even people who weren't journalists, the moment they heard Sean Spicer say that we were like, uh oh. This is not going to, you know, this whole administration is not going to go the way people are hoping it might. Because, of course, people were thinking, including Obama and Hillary Clinton, they thought that he might rise to the occasion of becoming a president for all Americans. And, and that didn't happen, did it? I think that was the hope of all of us, including myself. Um, you know, I think you had to believe that if you were able to um, make an impact in the room, with someone like Donald Trump, then all of your years of service and dedication to the United States would have mattered. Unfortunately, he listened to no one. Um, but the thing, Anthony, about, you know, the crowd size and Sean Spicer, um, I think what's really important to remember for myself in the beginning was that I was really um, just solely dedicated to the East Wing. I really wasn't, um, you know, in those conversations. Yes, I was I could hear the news. And yes, it, I mean, the drama of what was going on originally. But I just think it's important to remember that when you're going a million miles an hour and you're working on so many different um, components of putting together something so impactful, like the East Wing of the White House, then, you know, you're not really focusing on too much of the media's voices uh, and that's my fault for not really focusing and seeing the actual, um, I don't want to use, God, Anthony. Uh, are you are you feeling, because I've seen from a lot of interviews that you've done that you do, f you almost feel guilty, sad about your own naivety. Yeah. And I, I, I feel like that that frustrates you the most. It, you're right. Um, it's something that I have not gotten over. I'm trying to. Um, because you can really look at yourself and say, how did you honestly not get it? How do you, how do you not get it? You know, and people go, but you always knew them. And truthfully, Melania was my friend. 
And I spent my time with Melania. But was she really my friend? No, right? So that's the whole other very complicated part of this. And so this comes down to those feelings, those feelings of friendship and betrayal, right? And that's where it humanizes those relationships. And I don't think there's one person in the world that can't understand what it feels like to be totally betrayed by someone, um, especially when you genuinely believe that that person is someone that cares for you like you care for them. Um, and then to realize that maybe none of it was ever real. And I, you know, I say to my children all the time, and I've said this several times out loud as well, is you cannot separate ethics and politics. And that is where my naivety, I feel like really is the central, it was my fault, was because I didn't know enough about politics. I didn't know enough about the people I was getting into business with. I didn't know enough about even what an inauguration entailed, um, nor did I understand the complexities of a presidential inauguration committee and all the different elements and entities that needed to be created in order to produce something of such magnitude. So yes, I do blame myself and it is my fault. Um, and you really can't go into a room and sign a contract with anyone unless you know who they are and what your job is going to be. The relationship that Trump and Melania as as president and first lady had with all Americans, and I, and I speak during the campaign as well, they're referred to as the base, their base. Now, you say that you know things are not all what they seem, and this is what I'm really interested in talking to you about today. The, the confidence trick that you fell for working for the first lady and, and being befriended by her and you befriending her and having that connection, that this, this grift that enables them to operate, they have convinced millions of people. I mean, the guy got 70 million votes that he is the, their friend, yes. that they care about these people. Just explain a little bit for us about who Trump and Mrs. Trump really are and what they would probably say about the types of people the Republican voters, MAGA Republicans, people living in, in, you know, beautiful apartments to trailer parks. I mean, it includes everybody, right? Mm -hmm. the, full, the full spectrum of, of people in the U.S. who have put their trust in Trump and they will literally give him their last dime. They, will, they love him. He says, I love you, as yes. he did to insurrectionists. Tell us about that kind of contemptuous relationship. Mm. It's so complicated because it's, again, back to what we were just speaking about, is how do you not know? How, how, how could you not, after, again, repeat, 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 every yeah. single day we hear Donald say something, which we know is a lie. I mean, it's factually backed up. You know, facts matter. The truth matters. Yeah. Melania, same thing. And I feel that, you know, so many people do use the word cult-ish, um, I don't like to use the word cultish because I don't have enough knowledge to understand um, the parameters of what ent that's entailed. But it is a way of um, they ingratiate themselves to you. They almost make you feel so special and honored to actually be in their presence. I mean, they they take on what you're giving out, basically. So. The more that you, within your own emotions, like if my myself would emit to a Melania the importance of children's social emotional well being, the importance of, you know, having a platform and initiative and bringing in the experts and the researchers and the roundtables of that passion to make, you know, change across the country. Well, if you're emanating that, they feed off of that. And so, as anyone would, as you're sitting there in dialogue like we are right now, the more persuasion that I, as, as your guest, am telling you, this is really what, who I am, this is what I want to do, you then feed into that, and it just makes me want to do it more and more, right? So there's this, I, I mean, they are experts at it. You know, it's, I've never seen anything like it in my entire life. It's so frightening because I wrote a, this one story about Rick Gates when I was over at Trump Tower visiting Melania and Donald. And I would have given both my right and left arm when Donald Trump told me he didn't know who Rick Gates was. And 
I didn't know who Rick Gates was because, again, I didn't know he was his deputy campaign chairman. Right. I knew that he was the deputy chairman of the presidential inauguration committee, but I had just met Rick. I didn't follow politics. I didn't know positions. So when I look back after you know what I've written in my, in my book, I think that I reflect upon those instances of, you know, whether it be Rick Gates, Tom Barrett, Boris Epstein. I mean, the list goes on and on. And I am re- all of a sudden now, years later, you know, reading these other books that people have written and hearing these other news stories. And I am just mesmerized by the fact that no one figured it out sooner. Do you know what I mean? Because I did, I, but I had to live it. I had to actually, you know, be someone who witnessed it so up close and personal um, to, I guess, come to terms with it. And am I fully, you know, at, at peace with myself to say, I, I figured it all out. No. And I don't think I ever will be at peace with myself for allowing myself to be so duped. But I wish the country and every single human being in it would realize that they do not care. And it's not a joke. It's not like, yes, it was Melania's jacket. They really do not care about anyone or anything about themselves. It, it, it's all about Trump. It always has been and it always will be. I just want to say something to you that I think is really important. And and. I'm sure people watching would feel the same. And that is that it's not your fault, you know, what what you experienced and the way that they grifted and, and suckered you in and brought you into the cult is not your fault. And I, I regularly on the show interview Steve Hassan, who is the cult expert, and he wrote the book, The Cult of Trump. I mean, When he was a young guy, he was also, this technique of undue influence was used on him, and he was brought into the Moonies cult, and he managed to get out, and then he dedicated his life to educating people and teaching people about how any vulnerability is what they go for. They find people's vulnerabilities, and they, you know, your Achilles heel, and they work it. They know exactly what they're doing. And that's why it's important that you know that it, it's not your fault. And, and, and I, I sense that you feel regret and I, I, I feel how emotional it is for you. But I think we've all had these types of relationships where people who you trust turn out to be toxic and, and there's no way of knowing. No, there wasn't. And I thank you for saying that to me. And, 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 I, and I genuinely feel, um, you know, I, I feel that you understand. And, and um, you know, but still for me, Anthony, I f- find myself so passionate about speaking out and, and telling women and children that, especially Melania and Ivanka, I think it's so important that it's not just about Donald. Um, it, it is as far as him as an elected official, but these women were so destructive and deceitful and duplicitous to everyone. Um, and again, it's not just about personal relationships. They outmoved one on one another without any blink of an eye. Um, and it was never for the betterment of anyone else but themselves. They're, you know, I, 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 I say it's completely complicit, right? I know myself, as soon as I witnessed any illicit activity, I immediately, you know, told Melania Trump. I immediately told Donald. And... Um, as well as, my, you know, maybe we'll talk about it later, but Stefan Pazentino, the White House ethics lawyer. And my experiences with all of these individuals was upfront and very, um, you know, I put it all on the table. Let's put it that way. And by doing that, what they needed to do was keep me silent. Um, but I never could have imagined speaking to um, someone in the White House, um, nonetheless, an ethics lawyer, who would then turn around and use that information to um, not expose everything that was going around um, or at least look into it, right? I'm not saying you have to blow the whistle immediately, but at least know that the people that are aware that nefarious activity is going on, that it needs to be looked into, not brushed under the rug and then thrown, you know, throw the rest of the people out, you know, in the garbage with it, which was what happened to me. The... The grift started very early on, didn't it? And the inauguration was 
uh, as has been exposed, very expensive, <laughs> more expensive than it probably cost to put it on. And you were charged with put it on, putting it on. Now, you were not privy to the the budget, the costs. You didn't sign off checks and stuff like that. That was out of your hands, as far as I know. But what was done to you, which was part of the reason why you felt inclined to start to cre- create evidence, you m- recorded some phone calls with Melania to build up a stock of evidence, is because you knew that they were turning on you. And the the grift about how, you know, why that that inauguration was so expensive. And we've seen since everything from trading cards to the cost of people staying in Trump properties. I mean, the money that he has made and the family has made throughout the administration is obviously unprecedented and completely illegal. But nobody was really around to enforce it. Just tell us a little bit about that inauguration and just why... That they they kind of put that controversy onto you. So, um, I believe that you know I'm still uncovering uh, new material. I'm literally daily um, that I have in my possession now that my lawyers have um, that I didn't have access to until the Trumps um, had me uh, brought into so many different uh, litigations, investigations, and depositions, and that was their. I think, you know, of all the things they did was one of their biggest mistakes. Look, I worked for Anna Winter for over a decade. I was the founding fashion director for Lincoln Center. I know my budgets. I know my events. I know how to put on a really great show and I know how to do it within the budgetary confinements of proper budgets. When I see something that's 10 times more of, you know, an extended price versus its, its cost at the unit price, I question that. And I was not given the authority to sign off on budgets, but I was handed budgets. And so I spoke out again, even before the White House, as I sat around the presidential inauguration committee's table with, you know, Tom Barrack, Rick Gates, Sarah Armstrong, you know, the RNC, you name it. They had a team of individuals that had access to the bank accounts, access to the checkbooks, access to signing off and pre-approving budgets. When... I was told to come in and, you know, produce two events, which turned into 18 events. I never believed that I was going to be responsible for broadcast production. And of course, Donald Trump's savior was Mark Burnett. Now, the world wants to believe that Mark Burnett doesn't have really any involvement. Well, that's where the whole story really gets um, fascinating and interesting as to why I was brought in, I believe. I was a great cover for everyone. Because all these different entities were created and I was Melania's direct contact and I was responsible for getting answers from them very quickly. But there were teams of individuals that also created an entity of, you know, a joint entity with me. And by doing that with me and me saying, look, I'm only signing an operating agreement. I don't want to get involved in master service agreements and production service agreements. There are about 10 different memorandums of understanding, memorandums of agreements, all without my signature. Nothing. Nothing was my, as far as uh, budgets were concerned, did I have approval on or signatory powers of? Zero. Until I got the, the bank statements after I was subpoenaed by the grand jury for the Southern District of New York, by the Intelligence Committee, by the United States Attorney General for the District of Columbia. And with those subpoenas, I needed to produce the documents, which I didn't have access to. So I needed to call my partners. And my partners had to then go to my lawyer's office at Paul Weiss and bring my lawyers all of that con, all of that information. And that's how we got our hands on it. So, and when I, but when I was first subpoenaed, you can bet that I was scared because the news and the media made it sound as if I, Stephanie Winston, was some like little flirt. But that's the thing, isn't it, about America, right? It's like, it's all the top line. The detail is kind of irrelevant. And the top line for Trump getting elected was, well, the guy's a huge success. He's on The Apprentice. He's got all these properties. He's the biggest building in Manhattan. And that's good enough to mean that he must he must be the right man for the job. And and we've learned with the benefit of hindsight that actually that's that's not the deal. And and I've learned as um, doing journalism here in the U.S., 
that I have to kind of really, you know, scrutinize the story to kind of get to the bottom of it. And, and I knew pretty quickly that you were the, the, the victim of, of a very kind of interesting confidence trick. And, but I do think that you represent 70 million people in many ways. Right. Because I understand that. everybody who voted for him and continues to, a, a couple of nights ago, he was at Kimberly Guifoyle's um, birthday party making mm-hmm. a speech, <laughs> repeating exactly the same grift. He's now saying that the Democrats stole the election using COVID. No, That's what he said. He, he will say whatever he has to say. And unfortunately, for those millions and millions of people that don't get the news, the real news, um, you know, in, in a timely fashion um, or by a network that actually is considered a network news organization versus just tabloids, um, they're going to listen to that because that's all they've heard over and over, right? I mean, the same thing is repeated. It is factual. When you listen to, you know, some of the greatest individuals that, that I, you know, re- represent Raskin, I mean, the facts are the facts, and yeah. people like me that wanted to believe otherwise or weren't educated enough, I wasn't educated enough. I didn't have insight when I would hear someone say something. It wouldn't really mean anything because I didn't have the backstory. Now that I've educated myself, now when I hear that 60 courts, 60, 60 yeah. courts, there is no, there wasn't, you know, there was no fraud. Yeah. Re- re- rejected his rejected his claims of, of election fraud and now Rupert uh, many Murdoch. of whom were judges that he had put, yes. put in yes. as well trump judges yeah yes and so 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 now you have this knowledge and now you understand that the this huge confidence trick that you got caught up in that 70 million people have been caught up in that is like a stain on on, a, on the american timeline of history trump's in the news well, is never out of the news. This week, the big news, and I'm interested in your reaction to this, is the Manhattan District Attorney's Office has now signaled to his lawyers that he could face criminal charges for his role in the payment of hush money to a porn star, the strongest indication yet that mm-hmm. prosecutors are nearing an indictment of the former president, according to four people with um, knowledge of the, of, the, of the matter. I mean, let's just talk about, you know, that period... Because Stormy Daniels, I think, is kind of brilliant in a way. The way she's turned this around, she is she's kind of hilarious, and she's she's almost playing him now. She's she's making him out to be the fool that he is, right. and and she has really turned this to her advantage. The downside is she's had a terrible time of it, and and as have you. And I don't want to diminish that aspect of it, but at least she is making the best of a bad situation. The reality is, it is alleged that Donald Trump had a relationship with her, an affair with her, or met up with her, whilst married to Melania, Mm -hmm. and Stormy Daniels was paid off with $130,000 that Michael Cohen had to write a check for to buy her silence because that relationship, if it got out, was not going to help his chances of becoming president. That's kind of basically it in a nutshell. Right. Where, where were you during that period? And, 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 you know, how do you feel about the fact that this now, what, six odd years later, is coming back to haunt him? Finally. No, really. Like, finally. Like, I, I that's, I, I actually can take a deep breath to know that that, accountability is finally coming for something so black and white. Donald Trump, $130,000. We heard the tape. We saw the checks. We heard about the affair, the alleged affair. We know what Michael Cohen did in regards to paying that off. And we know that Donald Trump was individual one. Now, these are facts that make me go, okay, justice and accountability what happened, right? So I think I come at this, Anthony, from a, a very different place. And I, and I, because I know the power of Bill Barr and I know what Bill Barr um, was able to do and not do with the Southern District over this case, as well as what he did to me at the Department of Justice, as well as my involvement with working with the Southern District of New York, um, which is still, you know, back to that same question about the inauguration. 
That's not just about the inauguration. It's about the Federal Elections Committee. It's about the GSA. It's about, uh, I mean, I, I could go on and on about that. The, the, um, the facts of this case in New York with Stormy Daniels, um, regardless if Melania, you know, had said to me, and which I've, you know, shared in the book, I did say, you know, she said it's just, you know, liberal media, right? Let me tell you, um, Melania knows who she married. And I've said this too. She knows exactly what's going on. She is not some benevolent, you know, side, you know, show that just sort of um, doesn't really know and, and, and is hurt in this whole. Uh, I think now I, I laugh, quite honestly, that fact that, you know, Donald didn't want to say anything because he didn't want to upset Melania. Is there is that part of their defense? You know, it was it was. Give me a break. Melania, she knew who she married. She knew who she, she knew who she married. And Storm, I mean, and he, it, obviously it has, wasn't the first time and probably not the last time, but she is a strong woman. And again, when the whole tape came out, you know, I mean, she canceled an interview with Anderson Cooper to have lunch with me. And I have to tell you, when I went to have lunch with her that day, I genuinely believed I would see tears in her eyes. Nothing, as if nothing happened. It was like, look, Stephanie, I know who I married. And he knows that everything has to be, will be opened up wide open. But there's, but that's the, again, that's where the, um, the mirage of Donald Trump, the, the control of Donald Trump takes over because it, I'm sorry, but the Me Too movement, hey, you have the Me Too movement, you have Donald Trump even just saying the P word or what he can do to women and violate them. And that has done nothing. And then Eugene Carroll, I mean, the lists go on and on. And Stormy, God bless her. God bless her for actually keep, keeping her, excuse my language, her shit together. Because this is hard. Being in the public's eye and everyone believing that you're the, you know, you, you know, should have uh, known better or I should have known but, better. But this is society, isn't it? That, that you, who do you believe? Right. The, the rich white man in the suit or the porn star you know, with, with no clothes on, right? And that, and that tragically is the, is, is the culture, you know, American culture, but it exists plen in plenty other countries as well. But I feel that Donald, again, it's because of those relationships. Beyond the man, the white man in the, in the, in the suit with the red tie, yeah. he um, extended himself into such different, um, not just cultural, but uh Society's business. I mean, he has the backing of some of the most prominent individuals. And again, in the media, as we know, Rupert Murdoch, I mean, was able to control the entire narrative for him. Um, just when, you know, exactly when Melania showed up on, you know, page on the front page of the post. I mean, we knew, she and I knew that was Rupert and Donald's doing. They needed to change the narrative, get it away from Donald, get it away from the story of what he may have or not have done with other women. And so what better than Melania showing up nude? Well, you know what? Yeah. It did change the conversation. And when did it change, though, for Melania? Because, you know, she grew up in the former Yugoslavia, Slovenia now. In a in a very kind of modest apartment block, one of those towers. Her her mum was like a seamstress. Her father fixed cars for the for the state. She you know she comes to New York to follow her dream to be a model. She's tall. She's beautiful. She has everything going for her in in that regard within that industry. Right. She happens to be at the right place at the right time. She's at a party. Donald sees her at a party, and and you know I don't know if you've noticed this, but I think they look alike. And I do. They have a very similar, that kind of cat's eye thing right. going on. And, you know, we're supposed to be attracted to people who look like us. So I don't actually think that, because, you know, often people see like a fat, rich guy with a, with a beautiful girlfriend and everyone's like, well, right. she's obviously with him for the money. I think to me anyway, maybe because I'm like a hopeless romantic, <laughs> but I, I actually think there was more to it than that initially. And, mm -hmm. I, and I think she really did fall in love with him. Whether he fell in love with her, I mean, who who knows and who cares? You've said before she was eye candy or arm candy mm -hmm. for him, right? Absolutely. So when did but when did the switch happen? You know, when when did she go from being a a, a a young Slovenian girl who wanted to kind of make it big in America to becoming a kind of complicit fascist? Because that's the bit I can't comprehend. 
Well, I think that's the part that is, is as confusing to you as it is and was to me and the rest of the world. But I think it's really important to remember one thing. Melania was not a top model until she was going to be marrying Donald Trump. And that's what got her the cover of Vogue. Before that, you know, there is this story, this, you know, White House biography Melania created for herself. I mean, we know it was filled with mistruths. Um, it was taken down. Uh, you know, so when I first met Melania, I saw a beautiful girl. I did. And a, and a heart I believe to match. And unfortunately, you know, for myself, I didn't care about her past. It didn't ever matter to me. So I never really questioned it. And I just um, felt this, you know, friendship that grew out of this. Again, I was working at Vogue. She was walking the halls of Vogue. And I say that because for me, meeting someone like Melania, she was just a breath of fresh air. She, you know, she was, again, like that older sister, that confident older sister of nothing really mattered. She loved how she looked. She loved just being free and going and doing. You know, I was working and I had my kids and I was always, you know, I had a lot. I was a, it was a very different mentality. So she brought that calm to me um, in a way that, again, because she... I believed also was a part of that world um, more intricately, yet had to learn that she really wasn't until, um, you know, later on. But I think what's also important, Anthony, is that Melania's beauty also captivates in a way that makes you want to believe her. So when I see and read, you know, on Twitter or all these other platforms where women um, and men um, you know, oh my God, look at our beautiful, you know, former first lady, you know, and they can, she, they compare Jill or Michelle, Michelle Obama. I don't understand how people do not understand that you can be a beautiful individual and you can enhance that beauty. Again, you can get plastic surgery, you can make up hairstylists. If you've got money to make yourself and you're fortunate to have the features that you can accentuate what you want to be, well, yeah. She is mesmerizing, and that is their tool. Because she is so beautiful and because she presents so well, the evil does not appear before you. And people, unless they fully know what's going on in that shell of a human being, would want to believe that she is as good on the inside as she is on the outside. And it is not at all. It's so... Um, it's depleted, it's dishonest, and it truly is, like I say in Melania and me, you know, I'm the sucker who bought the 24 carat, you know, piece of junk on the street corner, um, as opposed to the real thing. And that's genuinely who Melania Trump is. I want to ask you about being best in a minute. We're going to take a quick break for our sponsor, and I'll explain what all that's about, and then we'll come back and talk more with Stephanie winston Wolkoff. Be smart, don't start, kick the habit, put it out before it puts you out. All phrases we've heard a hundred times, yet we still continue to have bad habits. Our sponsor, Fume, is on a mission to accelerate humanity's breakup from the bad habits that consume far too many of us. Fume is a natural diffusive device that uses plants and behavioral science to help you trade out your negative habit for a positive one. Fume is not a vape, it's a non-electronic device designed to transform your negative habits. Instead of pods filled with potentially harmful chemicals like a vape, Fume uses cores infused with plants like peppermint and cinnamon for delicious natural flavours. Fume's new version 2 model is snappy and tactile. With an adjustable airflow dial and a magnetic end cap, your fingers will always have something to do. I got one for my sister, and she loves the simplicity of utilising flavoured air through a stylish device to help her with bad habits. The easiest way to stop a bad habit is to switch to a positive one, and Fume is designed perfectly to do that. It's Fume's goal to make switching easy and even enjoyable. They have thousands of five-star reviews from people just like you who've successfully switched when other solutions just didn't work. Head to tryfume.com and use code WEEKEND to save 10% off when you get the Journey Pack today. The Journey Pack comes with three unique flavors and the new version 2 Fume to help kickstart your positive habits. 
That's tryfum.com and use code WEEKEND to save an additional 10% off your order today. Stephanie, on the 8th of March, it was International Women's Day. And Melania Trump tweeted for the first time in in quite a while, because she's kind of gone quiet. In fact, I think she's been seen since January, with, with Donald Trump anyway. So she tweeted, On International Women's Day, we are reminded that all women have unique gifts to share with the world, and we must lift each other up to achieve our collective goals and dreams. Hashtag International Women's Day. And uh, she got about 736 retweets. Um, you probably would have thought it would get more right. than than that, considering she's a former first lady. But what I was most interested in was there was a lot of very positive replies of people going, thank you, first lady. You know, you're our, you, you know, you're an amazing person. You've really influenced us. And you know, just lots of nice kind of schmaltzy stuff, which mm-hmm. is, which is, absolutely valid for those people that that believe that what do you think i don't want to put words into your mouth was that a genuine tweet well i don't know if you saw how what i retweeted um about I did not, that no, tweet. Tell me. but um when i was working in the white house uh with melania um carolyn maloney actually approached us to get involved for melania trump to support the building of this museum and um, Melania wanted nothing to do with it, zero interest. And so I actually put part of the letter up on my tweet um, to show everyone, again, I come with the facts. I'm not going to say something if I don't have the backup to prove it. Um, it's the same thing with her Be Best initiative. Uh, you know, again, if you don't have the experts and the think tanks behind you, it means nothing. And for Melania, I genuinely believed in the beginning that she cared about creating um, and supporting women and children. And so for me, I went and spoke at the United Nations on her behalf, the first you know, International Women's Day. I um, genuinely believed that she cared about it and that it was something that she could get behind, obviously, as the First Lady of the United States. It's just more, it's, it's the same thing. It, it's, they're, they're empty words. They so it's a, perfor- it's a performance, a little bit like taking Michelle Obama's script, right, from, the, from that speech and plagiarizing it and, and saying it and not thinking that anybody would check. 100% is the same thing that they did when, after I got thrown on the bus and I left the White House and the experts for the initiative that we were, you know, about to launch left with me. I mean, she used Michelle Obama, another you know booklet from Michelle yeah. Obama and changed some of the wording. It's mind blowing to me. And again, they don't care because their followers don't care. They just don't care. It's almost as if every instinct that you've ever had about them as a kind of crime family, where your subconscious, the subconscious gives you the benefit of the doubt. No, they they couldn't do that. It wouldn't they wouldn't do that. I mean trust your instinct. Trust your me. your instinct is right. Like if they if you see something and you think, could it be the reason your body is telling you that this is fishy or tricky is because it probably is. I wish I had trusted myself more because I felt it immediately. I really did. I mean a week in and I came crying home to my husband and I, I was like, I, I don't know I just something doesn't feel right with all of these people and what what you know this was the planning of the inauguration. And um, and then once I got into the White House, but people must go with their gut instinct. And and as you say, you know, it's, it's the most important thing to follow. A lot of home truths are coming out about who these people really are, not just the Trump family, but Republicans generally. And nobody more so than Tucker Carlson, who is the mouthpiece for the Republican Party on Fox, and now these uh, text messages have been revealed. This is in this uh, this case with Dominion Voting Systems, who are suing Fox for saying that the election was stolen and it was their machines that were, were, mm-hmm. were at fault. I just want to read a text message that Tucker Carlson wrote. It just said, we are very, very close to being able to ignore Trump most nights. I truly can't wait. I hate him passionately. We're all pretending we've got a lot to show for it because admitting what a disaster it's been is too tough to digest. But come on, there really isn't an upside to Trump. 
Those are the uh, words of, of Tucker Carlson. It's a, it's a bit like, you know, Emperor's New Clothes or Wizard of Oz, you know, showing the wizard from behind the curtain, operating the machinery. The, the reality is that this entire grift, everything from Trump doing anything to help anybody other than himself and it all being amplified and repeated on Fox with various hosts all mm-hmm. hating him behind the scenes, mm-hmm. thinking the guy's an idiot and, and he, because he's a moron. I mean, mm-hmm. the, the guy is a moron and yet the greatest grift in, in history was convincing enough people to vote for him so that he could win the presidency. Well, his greatest, again, his relationships, that Rupert Murdoch relationship for him was his, you know, he, he, he it unv- unveiled doors and ropes of any kind in order to give him the credibility that he needed, right? So Tucker Carlson, you know, Hannity, Ingram, like these people, as we've seen in these texts, and within this, thank God, this Dominion, you know, case, we're actually reading and seeing exactly what was written. But the problem is still, Anthony, is how is it possible that not, you know, maybe one or two Republicans, you know, have stood up to say something? But how is it that you can read that, see that, hear that, and represent the United States of America and not just say enough is enough? We're not telling you to not be a, a party of, you know, and be, believe in what you believe in. We're saying stand for the truth. Liz Cheney is a Republican. She stood for the truth. The facts matter. Where is everyone else? I mean, I look at, you know, Kevin McCarthy. I mean, it's just it's a it's a disgrace. And it's it's just. It's frustrating. It's frustrating because the rest of those 70 million people are still believing this grift. Donald's still profiting off of them. He's creating companies. Now he's writing a second book using Don Jr.'s company, right? So everything is about self-interest, self-profiting, and the truth doesn't matter, obviously, because as much as we all now know, as what we've seen, Tucker Carlson's not only going to say he can't stand Donald Trump, which doesn't surprise me, he's now going to, he, you know, air his video, and nobody's going to challenge that? Why doesn't Rupert Murdoch come on Fox News? I bet you he'd have the best ratings ever and do a sit down with the three of them, Hannity, Ingram, and and Carlson, and say, okay, let's just hash this out. Bye-bye, Donald Trump. I mean, really, move on. But but Murdoch has admitted it now in his deposition with, with Dominion Voting Systems. He's said that he knew that the election wasn't stolen. He knew it wasn't rigged. He knew that there was no fraud. And he has admitted that he did not tell his hosts to change direction and tell the truth. Now, we all knew who Rupert Murdoch was before this, right? We, 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 you know, he has the same power in the UK as he does here in the States and obviously Australia and plenty of other territories as well. And Fox is not a news channel. It's an opinion entertainment channel. And unfortunately, a lot of people watch it and think it's real. And that is often their argument, and that's been used in cases against Tucker Carlson before. You know, Fox say, well, everyone knows that he's, right. he's just entertaining them. But they don't. Okay. And one thing I thought was very interesting was, um, you know, as these text messages have come out and are being published on social media, I'm seeing replies from Republicans, uh, MAGA Republicans, Trump supporters, and they're saying, he didn't really say this, did he? that he hates Trump? I mean, is this even true? And then other people say, no, it uh, can't be true. Of course, it's not true. And then other people say, well, if it is true, then, you know, I, I really feel stupid. And so it's starting very slowly. People are starting to get a sense that maybe what they're seeing in front of them, this this production, because that's all this is. The whole thing is a is a performance. Well, it is, it's just a, it's just for show. It is just for show. And that's why, you know, again, I keep referring to things as the Mark Burnett production. I mean, even the RNC for Donald Trump was produced by individuals that, you know, again, the quality of entertainment in our country, in our society, in the world, there's nothing more, you know, captivating. And so he is an entertainer. You got to give him that, right? He's, 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 he's like, it's a train wreck and it's a circus car, but 
it keeps you coming back for more. Yeah, he's a great he's a great performer. He's a great marketeer. He's a great public speaker. He he's like a stand up comedian. You know, he's pretty funny sometimes. They are horrible human beings. Yeah. Sorry, I I just no. I, I, and unfortunately, too many people are still. I I do see a little bit of what you're saying that people are trying to question it on social media, but there's not enough people that of his followers. You know that his his base. Um, are not on those platforms that we are, where they're hearing both sides. They're following one side only, and that's his side of information. And again, when it comes from his tweets and his social media platform, where he's saying that, you know, about, he continues his lies daily, no one is going to want to listen to anything else. And how do we break that is what I'd like to know. How do we change that narrative? And who can do that in the Republican Party and actually make a difference? Do you think this family, we haven't spoken about Ivanka, and I know that she's your favorite person on the planet, but do you think this family know that they are committing crimes, that, that, that they are going against the law of the United States, that they, they are raising money and taking advantage of people? Do you think there's any sense of like, you'll never guess what we just did, like when they get home, or are they totally completely convinced that they are correct, that they are saving America, and that they are doing what is best for the country? Well, I think sociopaths, you know, believe in whatever they believe in, right? They, they yeah. can believe that they are right and they are doing um, the correct, uh, you know, fundraising and film Because it's a large gathering of sociopaths, you know, it's like, it's but all the kids. right? Yes. It's, 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 it's everybody. It's I mean, it's, it's, right. It is very frightening. However, when you're part of, uh, you know, this, uh, I mean, the crime syndicates are, 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 you know, scary for a reason. Um, they are able to get other individuals on that bandwagon. And once you're hooked on and once you've, you know, reached your hand out and agreed to accept something um, from the other side, then you're committed. And I think, you know, that has led to many of these individuals keeping their mouths shut, obviously. They've benefited somehow, some way. Um, we do know some ways, you know, through uh, different donations and whatever. I, I mean, that's a whole nother show. But I do believe that Ivanka, Melania, you know, the women's side of this is, um, it's, what, it's whatever they need to say to keep the narrative away from anything illegal or illicit and to continue again, like you said, their base of 70 million, that's plenty for them. That's plenty for them. It's rev it's revenue. Yes. And that's all that it is. That's all that it is. I mean, the fact that Melania created NFTs or that she, you know, is working with an artist or doing something in, you know, to help children and adopt, you know, that, that have been adopted. I mean, that was one of the first things we spoke about originally when we were forward facing, you know, thoughts about what she would be involved with. No interest. Now, all of a sudden, oh, my God, adoption. Great way to, you know, make a profit. It's, it's, it's just, again, and no transparency whatsoever, right? You don't know where the money's going. And again, when you start thinking about who those individuals are behind the non-for-profits that they're working with also, there's a whole cascade of individuals that you don't want to have any, you wouldn't touch them with a million foot pole, nor would I, but they do because they are all in this together. Many of the people who took the stand uh, and gave evidence at the January 6th investigation were Republicans tr who worked for Trump. They worked for the White House. They worked in the West Wing. Cassidy Hutchinson, for example, who was probably as close to him in that orbit as you were to Melania. You know, people who have a conscience yes. and finally realized that they'd been duped, that the country had been duped, and they chose to serve their country in the, in, with, by giving evidence rather than support their supreme leader. Um, that hasn't really kind of made any inroads with Republicans either, with MAGA Republicans. The idea that all of the evidence came from people like yourself who are exposing the grift and the fact that Trump had, you know, Trump had never read the Constitution. He had no concept yeah. about about foreign affairs or international trade or, or national security. I mean, to have a, 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 a 
commander-in-chief who refuses to read the presidential daily briefing right. is is so dangerous for all of us who live here in this country. And, and yet he somehow managed to get away with it. And, and really people like Mark Milley, you know, these generals were the ones keeping us safe, right? Yes. They were having to go over and above their jobs to maintain international peace yes. because this, this guy throwing ketchup at the wall in the other room was not to be trusted, right? right? So just talk to me about, I mean, do you feel vilified knowing that a lot of people now, Stephanie Grisham's another one, people who have come forward and ha- are starting to kind of talk more openly about the administration? There are certain individuals that I cannot um, think it's, I don't think it's right to allow them to just whitewash their um, participation in the administration. I think there are like General Milley, you know, General Kelly, I mean, Cassidy Hutchinson, like none of us, myself included, we never lied. We never um, told, uh, you know, the public or people behind closed doors, whether it be prosecutors or any type of other individuals, anything but the truth. And the difference there for me is those people have had to suffer the same as every of, as the other individuals who allowed the grift and allowed the lies and publicly came out and lied on their on the Trump's behalf, right? So I think there's two different groups of people that worked for the Trumps that tried to make a difference. Um, some of them again along for the ride until it wasn't good for them, and then oh okay now I'm gonna now I'm gonna speak up, but then there were those myself included you know, Olivia Troy, like we believe in the truth and we never compromised our integrity and loyalty and honesty at any point in time and weren't willing to do it for no amount of money, position or anything. And so those individuals, I mean, I am grateful and thankful to see them. I wish there was a heck of a lot more and there should be. And I'm shocked that there aren't because how can you not at this point? Again, I don't care what anyone says about me. Oh, you knew and you should have known. I can't believe you got... Yeah, I got into it. I thought I could make a difference. I was helping my friend. All of those things are true. But I never lied. And also, it was more important to show up, speak up, and tell the truth to hope that we could, you know, regain some of our diplomacy and empathy back into our country. Because right now, it's just shattered by these people. Lying is a theme, isn't it? Uh, yeah. With, with, with Republicans, both in terms of you know, in Congress, in the Senate, with policy, just like the language. Of course, with the expose, supposed expose of the January 6th tapes, you know, which again is a big load of nothing, like the Twitter files or, or, right, any of these things that, you know, Hunter Biden's laptop, you know, these are all things that you can never really get to the bottom of because there's nothing there. Right. Pizzagate or whatever. I mean, it's all just wonderful uh, it's a stick, right? It's, yeah. It's, yeah, it's 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 just stuff that distracts from from reality, and you know they're they're now praising McCarthy and Tucker Carlson, you know the Congress people yes. for for doing a service to the country. Well, all of this video was already available to anybody. In fact, most of us watched it live. You know, this is this is the other thing that again people conveniently no. forget. And that. I'm thankful we, that McConnell actually came out and said something. Yeah. You know. Thankfully, someone did because we did. We were all watching it live. And even Merrick Garland came out and said, look, we all watched this happen and unfold. This was an attack on, you know, our institution. Like there, there's no doubt about that. So what Tucker Carlson's doing and what Fox News is doing is, again, for generations to come is so detrimental. And they could care less about, obviously, their forget about their children, but their grandchildren and their grandchildren's children, because if they did, they would put a stop to this. But it's still all about revenue and ratings, yes. because some of these secret text messages that Tucker Carlson sent out, talking about, you know, this is going to be terrible for our audience. If we acknowledge that Trump lost, then, you know, our audience is mm-hmm. not going to like it, and, and our ratings are going to go through the floor and, you know, the revenue. And so... I mean, is this something, because I don't really know of this culture. In the UK, most people are poor, you know, and, and people that do have any money are normally Chinese or Russian or from the Middle East. You know, the, the Brits are, are, are broke. Um, so I don't, I'm not, I don't really recognize this culture. I'm learning about it here in the US. But this idea that money and earnings and revenue 
is more important than anything. Like everybody has their price. Is that is that a, you know? There's a cultural question. Is that exclusive to the U.S. or is it just exclusive to the sociopaths that you describe and the people that put themselves up for Congress? You know, the 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 George Santoses who are where yeah. everything is about you know making well, a living. Anthony, let me tell you, I I've worked in the entertainment, fashion, sport, beauty industries for years. I mean, decades. I've never met anyone like the Trumps, nor their, can, you know, their allies and individuals that have uh, teamed up with them to continue to grift or to lie to the American people. I don't think this is America. And I don't believe, um, again, when I say I've worked with every C-level executive, I genuinely have. And with respect, they come to the table honestly with their integrity, and they're not willing to sacrifice that just to make a buck. And I think those relationships are the ones that mean the most to me, obviously. And those are the people that I, you know, that know they can call me and I can still call them because I'm going to show up with facts and I'm going to show up knowing that I want to do the right thing. I mean, I don't, so I don't see it as just, I, I don't believe that's America. I don't, and I never experienced it except in this Trump world. Because the tragedy is that the people that are giving away their last dime are the people who have nothing. Nothing. The people who are he is grifting off are not the wealthy. Yes, he no. has benefactors, and I'm sure there's money coming from the Middle East and Russia and goodness knows whatever else. But really, the people who can afford it the least are the people that are giving away the largest percentage of their wealth. And well, that no is one's, nothing. Anthony, no one's been held accountable for anything. Anything. Yeah. So, I mean, that's the unfortunate part of all this too is that those people that are giving away their last penny genuinely i mean you yeah. watch these interviews it's heartbreaking yeah. because they are willing to give donald trump ten dollars that was that ten dollars for those people is yeah. dinner on the table and yet maybe if they saw someone within the republican party be held accountable that is a public face not the seditionists not the people on the foot soldiers right everyone that's been held accountable are individuals those are the people that were writing those $10, you know, giving those $10 donations. And those people are now suffering. You would think that those 70 million people would actually understand that everyone that is now being held accountable for January 6th are the, those people that actually listened to Donald Trump and did his dirty work for him, as opposed to any of the gentlemen in the nice suits with the, you know, red bright ties and, you know, buttoned up shirts. Yeah. Those, I mean, what, at what point do people say, you know, that's my friend, my brother, my, my relative is in jail because Donald Trump. How could you write a, you know. But that's the grift, isn't it? It's the yes. same grift as people not believing Stormy Daniels and believing Donald Trump. 100%. And, and, it will, and that will continue to the end of time, tragically, because that is the, the disparity, you know, the, the, that is the kind of unfortunate disparity of, of, of wealth and how invariably still in America it's kind of white, rich men who own the land, who make the decisions, who are doing, you know, who, who are making the world turn on their terms. Right. And Donald Trump made that circle a little bit tighter and a little bit smaller to his own benefit. And those individuals at the top, even as far as, you know, IPOs and different co corporations and different entities have bought, you know, companies. Again, this gets into a whole nother conversation. But Anthony, he understands how to monetize each industry, whether it be healthcare, transportation, you know, audio, video, whatever it is. And the underlings, if you read these chat rooms, if you see all these individuals that are now out of jobs, the little guys, yeah, no one's going to be able to catch up. They, they, they've all suffered so much. Forget about even what they're donating. It's what's been taken away from them. Yeah. So it's heartbreaking. He spoke last week about freedom cities, building freedom cities uh -huh. where people can prosper. What I presume he means by a freedom city is a place for white cisgender people where women do the cleaning and men enjoy, yeah, Stepford, enjoy all the... It's the Stepford Wives, right? It's the yeah. Stepford Wives, yeah. you know, meets... Again, it, it's, it's a frightening reality, but it's honestly, it's just another way to, uh, you know... It's, well, it's, a bit, it's a bit like the wall, isn't it? Build a wall because I'm in construction. Right. 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 It, it, it's 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 exactly that. It's 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 just forwarding his own business, and and you know, to, even talking out loud. You know, he says the quiet stuff out loud, doesn't yes. he? But you know, I'll build a big, beautiful wall, and this is what I'm good at, and you know, it's just 
it's and just amazing that that people yeah. continue to buy it when it when the lies and the and this this very basic use of you know moronic language yeah. is is so obvious. But Anthony, but he had the people behind him within yeah. those industries to to prop him up. He doesn't right as much anymore. The people that actually were building those buildings, and a lot of them were his partners, or building the wall, or they're all part of entities, whether it's construction, real estate. I mean, they've all profited off the Trump presidency. Some have been smart enough now to actually back away a little bit and realize, okay, this is not who I'm going to support, nor am I going to write any more checks to this. So everyone in his orbit is complicit. And that's what gives him the license to continue is because it's a bit like the way he would pay people off or buy people off or sue people. It's like the the relationships are all done through lawyers and and not through trust. Exactly. And I have to tell you, and that's exactly why I pressed record on Melania Trump, because after you're told that you, again, as someone's friend, but yet also you're in the individual who's witnessed everything and has come to you to say, this is, here it is on a platter. What do you want to do about it? One, my, Melania looked at me and told me that the White House counsel told her she is not allowed to say anything on my behalf and that it, they were going to make it look as if I was complicit in the presidential inauguration finance mismanagement and then make it look as if I was fired. You bet I pressed record after that day. And I am so grateful and thankful that I did. I have a final question for you, and that is that there is a whole bunch of uh, cases against Donald himself, uh, as well as his organization, which really recently got done, the Trump organization really, really got done, and Alan Weisselberg took the, took the flack for that. But uh, whether it be the Southern District of New York, whether it be Fanny Willis, whether it be Jack Smith... All of these very serious, high-level investigations. Do you think that the law will ever catch up with him and his people? Do you think that he's going to be taken away out of Trump Tower or Mar-a-Lago in handcuffs? Do you think that this story will have the ending that it deserves? I'm ho- I am hopeful. And I am, um, for the first time, really starting to believe that there will be the accountability. Now, as far as he being in handcuffs, you know, again, how do you, where do you put a former president? Um, but as far as um, holding him accountable and his, some of his family members and some of the other people are very close to him, he can't get away with all this because you know what? There's too much evidence. There's too much evidence. And no one was going to sit back. And I do believe this. I mean, Michael Cohen has kept his voice loud, thankfully, and gratefully. And I don't care what anyone says about Michael. Oh, Michael this, Michael that. Yeah, Michael this, Michael that. But you know what? Michael Cohen showed up and started speaking the truth. And again, someone like Michael, who now you see this full circle come with Stormy Daniels and Michael. This is like, to me, the I, I, again, it, it's like, uh, what's, what am I, what's the word I'm looking for? It's, um, I mean, it's like, it, Anthony, what's the word I'm looking for where it's serendipitous? It's serendipitous. Right. It, the, I finally feel like, because the fact that Michael went to jail on behalf of Donald, and then, then there are other things that I'm aware of that I've never spoken about, just knowing some of the details. Oh my God. The fact that that case almost just disappeared was so disheartening. And it's, it was gut punching. It was, I honestly was sick for days, actually months. So I do believe that he will be held accountable. And I don't think it's so simple just to get away with saying and holding his hands up and like Ivanka now saying, I didn't have any responsibility. Yeah, Alan Weisselberg took the fall, but Alan Weisselberg was also involved in so many other things that he did not speak up about. Um, they're still, he's still protecting Donald Trump. But thankfully there are some individuals that are in the grand jury that have no choice but to tell the truth. Um, and the truth has now finally, I believe, caught up. Okay. I'm so thrilled that uh, you had the time to talk to us today. Thank you and, so much, um, Anthony. I, I, I wish you luck with your book, obviously, but I also wish you luck with finding some uh, inner peace because of the, the trauma that you've suffered for, with what you've been through. And I'm sure there is help not just for you, but for 
millions of people that have suffered at the, the hands of, of this Trump crime family. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. My thanks to Stephanie Winston Wolkoff. I'm Anthony Davis. Please subscribe to The Weekend Show on YouTube or as an audio, audio podcast. And also don't forget to visit patreon.com slash five minute news for exclusive Patreon only videos, bonus content, live Q&As for members. So subscribe for exclusive access. Join me next week with a brand new special guest and three more factual news stories to discuss on the 5-Minute News Weekend Show with Midas Touch. 